We uh, have come here today, brothers and sisters, because there are so many things happening in our world that we need to see where we're up to in relation to fulfilling Bible prophecy. There's so much happening, of course, that we're not going to be able to include everything that we would like to include in this address this afternoon. But we are going to have a look at part of Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 1 to 13. I think you'll agree we live in a very disturbed and angry world. And that's exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ said would be the case before he came to raise the dead. Revelation 11:18 makes it very plain, doesn't it? That the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints. And them that fear thy name, small and great. And shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And mankind, of course, is destroying the earth. Primarily, of course, morally, but also physically. And the day of divine judgment is at hand. The day of our destiny being determined, brothers and sisters, is at hand. And we need, therefore, to, to clearly see how the angels are working among the nations. And there has been, over the last couple of years, a speeding up of Bible prophecy being fulfilled in such a way that you cannot, you cannot help but see that those angels are at work and that the day is at hand for, for you and me to meet our, our Master, our Lord Jesus Christ. Before I get into Ezekiel 38, 1 to 13, though, I thought I might just give a brief bulletin of very recent news. So what's dominating the news right at the moment? And its relationship, of course, to Bible prophecy. Well, Australia's relationship with China is in trouble due to the US-China trade war and US moves to blunt China's increasing influence in the Indo-Pacific region. And that will mean, ultimately, that if Australia supports America, that it will force Australia to look to other nations for future trade. Australia is also losing its influence in the Pacific region. You'll recall that our Prime Minister has been there recently, and it didn't go all that well because those tiny nations in the Pacific said, well, what about climate change? What about you reducing your carbon emissions? Why are these things happening? Well, are they related to the overall big picture of Bible prophecy? Yes, they are. Because you see, we've got, a, we've got Britain facing a hard Brexit. And a hard Brexit means they come out with no agreement with the European Union for future trade. No customs agreement, no agreement at all. And that's going to force Britain to renew its vital trade with its former colonies. And if Australia is having its exports reduced to China, where do you think they might go to sell them? You see, this is exactly what Bible prophecy says. Bible prophecy requires Britain and its young lions to be merchants working together as allies who will, of course, uh, object to the invasion of Israel by Gog and his forces. What about Britain? Well, they've got a new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who's very much in the mould of Donald Trump. And, of course, he's facing the prospect of a hard Brexit. His problems are that his option that he thought he had, that he could go to an election before the 31st of October, has disappeared because they had a by-election in Wales and he lost, the Conservatives lost that seat. He now has a majority of one. In other words, that option is gone. The backstop, of course, which has to do with Ireland and Northern Ireland, is not supported by the DUP party, uh, the, the party of Ian Paisley, long since dead now, but anti-Catholic, anti-Europe party. They're not happy about the, the backstop because they want to remain part of Britain. And Boris Johnson, as did, that, as did uh, Theresa May, depends on the support of that DU party uh, in Northern Ireland. And so he's got a problem there as well. The European Union has made it clear again to Johnson that it will not budge on the agreement reached with Theresa May. And Jeremy Corbyn, the Labor leader, of course, has proposed a vote of no confidence uh, in the Tories, and he will do two things. He will put through some kind of, of uh, uh, platform to have a, another vote on Brexit and then call an election. Now, I think we can see where that's heading, and I'm going to do a little bit more work on Brexit a little later on in our talk here today. The latest on the financial front. And this is how we propose to conclude our talk this afternoon. Non-government financial commentators continue to warn that a recession will arrive in either 2019 or 2020. 
The US-China trade war and the problems in Hong Kong have destabilised stock markets around the world. And of course, historically low interest rates indicate the real depth of the economic malaise that this world faces. And the latest sign is this. Inverted yields in the US bond trade signal the onset of a recession. When you have inverted yields, it, on every occasion in the past, it's been followed within a short space by a deep recession. It's coming. The world knows it's coming. And of course, the US-China trade war is edging the world powers towards that economic precipice. And of course, the recent and growing flight towards gold confirms all of that. You may be aware that Russia and China have been bringing in huge amounts of gold over the last 10 years. They know it's coming. See? So the world around us knows that the economic prosperity that we've enjoyed for a long, long time is about to disappear. And that's very, very important for Christadelphians, as we shall see. Well. What's the content of that section of scripture that we read a little while ago? Very, very important context. Now, Brother James this evening is going to be dealing with matters in, probably in this context as well, in relation to Israel. So I'm not going to be covering the matters that concern Israel so much, except perhaps for their relationship with their neighbours. So what we're going to focus on in this talk this afternoon are the early verses of Ezekiel 38, which require a dictator to dominate the Eurasian continent. The territory east and north of Israel to be under Gogian control. We're going to then slip down to the last uh, verse that we read, verse 13, and have a look at in, in relation to what's happening with Yemen, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, and in particular, of course, Britain. Not so much with its young lions, that's, we can't put that in, but we'll, we'll, we want to talk about Britain and where Brexit is heading. And, and there are some things, of course, that Scripture has to say about that. We're looking, brothers and sisters, for the formation of this massive confederacy of powers that we've just read about in Ezekiel chapter 38. This massive confederacy there in the red arrows, coming from all points of the compass and invading the land of Israel. They will be opposed by the Tarshish powers and, and the powers uh, that, are, that are described as Sheba and Dedan in Ezekiel 38 and verse 13. So let's go right to the start. In verse 2 of Ezekiel 38, we have a prophecy concerning a dictator. His title is Gog, which means in the Hebrew language, the one at the top. Here is a dictator. And of course, it's speaking about what they call in politics the vertical of power, which used to exist in the, in the days of Brother Thomas in the Tsarist regime. But of course, that was overthrown in 1917. It's back. Vladimir Putin has restored the vertical of power in Russia. He is a dictator. His word is law. He doesn't refer to a Politburo or to a ministry. His word is law. That's what the Bible requires. The one at the top, a dictator. And so, of course, when you look at this man, you can see the way that things are being shaped. He, of course, would have to stand down if he followed the Constitution, which requires that you stand down after two terms, two six-year terms. That would be in 2024, but he's not going to stand down. Because as this article will tell you, this is May the 18th, 2018, there's already strong moves in Russia to scrap the constitutional limit of two consecutive presidential terms, enabling Vladimir Putin to remain in power past 2024. But that's not the only thing that's happening in Russia. There's also a very strong move, as this article tells you, to actually make Putin a czar. And to put the portion of the article that we can have a look at is this one. A group of pro-Kremlin Kremlin activists has, has a different idea. They want to proclaim Tsar Vladimir as the Tsar of Russia. And they said this, we will do everything possible to make sure Putin stays in power as long as possible. And that was greeted with thunderous applause from hundreds of Russian Orthodox and members of the country's top political parties. So that's probably going to happen too. And I think Brother Thomas will prove to be more accurate than we probably thought he might be. Because he wrote in Elpis Israel, page 432, at some time hereafter, and that not far off, a Tsar of Russia will be both Emperor of Germany and Autocrat of all the Russias could prove to be very, very accurate, couldn't it? If they get their way and make Putin a czar. 
Well, we also read in verse 2 of Ezekiel 38, and this, of course, you're, you're probably fully aware of the more accurate translation, which should read this way, and in fact, as you can see it there uh, on the, the, the bottom of that slide, Gog, the dictator of the land of Magog. That's his land. And he's prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Rosh being the most ancient form of the name Russia. And, of course, it's very important that we recognise that Magog plays a part here. You look at historians, they say Magog is this territory that you can see there, bounded by that red line. What's the largest country in that particular area? Well, it's not Germany, it's actually the Ukraine. And, of course, the Ukraine was the original homeland of the kingdom of the Rus. That's where they began their history as a nation called Rus or Russia. And their first capital was Kiev in 989 AD. So here we have the heartland, the original homeland of the kingdom of Russia. Now, if you're trying to re-establish, as Putin is, an empire, rebuild the Russian empire, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to actually get your heartland, which is why... For the last 10 years, Putin has been trying to undermine Ukraine in various ways. He is aiming to take over that country. He's already got Crimea. He's already got a slice, a bite out of the eastern area of, of the Ukraine. He has troops in another section uh, of the Ukraine that have been there for a long time. He's not going anywhere. And he will eventually, ultimately, take this territory. And we will have... Gog of the land of Magog. And that will be a wonderful fulfilment, but we might not see that from here. We'll have to wait and see. That he will eventually take this country, Ukraine, by conquest is well known. Because you see, a female tank commander who defected for love, this article said in March this year, warns Kiev of invasion plans. She also brings word of Russian plans for a massive invasion. Now, she was a commander uh, uh, in, the, in the Russian forces, switched over to the Ukraine, and the cat is out of the bag. He is planning to take the Ukraine by conquest. So I want to ask a series of questions about the, the movements of this Russian power. Why did Russia move into Syria in 2015. Is there any prospect of Russia leaving Syria in the future? Why has Putin completely changed his approach to Turkey after two years of conflict after the Turks shot down a Russian jet on the 24th of November uh, 2015 over the border between Syria and Turkey? Why is Russia forging close ties with both Turkey and Iran? Why is Putin dabbling in the politics of Iraq Afghanistan and Pakistan, which he is. Now, I ask that series of questions because, of course, we want to answer them. We want to answer them with the scripture as to why these things have been happening in our times. So let's have a look and see what's happening. What about Putin and Turkey? Well, as I said, when the Turks shot down their jet uh, in 2015, Putin hammered Turkey. He closed the borders. He sent them a letter, in fact, two weeks afterwards, saying, we demand the return of the Hagia Sophia to the Russian Orthodox Church. He made all sorts of demands, but he's changed. Because, you see, now we have articles like this. This one comes from last year, and there have been a lot since, which tell us that Putin is now building a relationship with President Erdogan of Turkey. Why this change? Well, you see, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Turkey is, in fact, a member of NATO. Turkey wants to join the European Union, and the European Union doesn't want Turkey. But they're quite happy to take Turkey's money to support NATO. So Putin says, well, if I cuddle up to Turkey, this is going to undermine NATO. All right? And that's exactly what he's on about. Because, of course, he has intentions for this place as well. We know that there are intentions. But the very way this man is going about it fits the description of Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, of the power of the little horn of the goat. 
And as Brother Thomas says, whichever power happens to be in control of Constantinople, as it was once known, now called Istanbul, that power is the little horn of the goat. And we know that Russia will have control of Constantinople to form the eastern leg of Nebuchadnezzar's image, and that will be the base of their operations to come down upon the mountains of Israel. So what does Daniel 8.25 say about the character of that particular power? And through his policy, he shall also cause craft, and Brother Thomas says that that should be priestcraft, to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. We're actually seeing that being played out in the way that Putin is now dealing with Turkey. Well, Mr Erdogan, of course, can see that there's some profit in cuddling up to Putin as well. But he's made a very big mistake because uh, we, it was reported uh, in March this year that he said that um, Istanbul's Hagia Sophia, which is currently a museum, which was as important to the Greek and Russian Orthodox churches as the Vatican is to Rome, Roman Catholics, okay? It's just as important to them. It's currently a museum, but it should be renamed a mosque instead of a museum after 31st of March 2019 elections. He's treading on thin ice because just a couple of years before, Putin demanded the return of the Hagia Sophia to the Russian Orthodox Church. So these are the sort of things that are happening. Now, of course, we know because Turkey is, uh, is accepting uh, very sophisticated weapons from the Russians, the S-400 missile, that America has, has cut off the, the intention to supply Turkey with the F-35 uh, fighter jet. And so the relationship between Turkey and America, who used to be allies, has broken down and Putin has built up his relationship with the Turks. That's why you see pictures like this. This, this is the heading of this particular article in April this year. Russia and Turkey are becoming allies, overshadowing Israel. And there's an analysis of that as to how that will affect Israel. So their alliances in the Middle East are shifting. They're changing in favour of the requirements of Bible prophecy, particularly the relationship between Russia and Iran. This is an article that talks about the implications for Israel, that, that Russia, Turkey are becoming allies and the long-term implications for Turkey, who used to be once a friend of Israel, uh, we know, because they are going to be invaded in due time uh, by the Gogian power that will take control of Constantinople. So I want to ask, or at least put forth, some more suggestions in relation to uh, this matter. Because, you see, there are three passages that require Gog to be in control of Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and portion of Pakistan. Now, those three references are Ezekiel 38, verse 5, Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, and Daniel 11, verse 40. Now, you're not going to have to use your thinking caps too much for the rest of this address, but I want you to use them for the next five or ten minutes. Because I want to take you to these passages in a moment, and we're going to have a look at them. Control of Syria and Iraq will mean possession of the territory of ancient Assyria by the latter-day Assyrian. And the same power referred to in Ezekiel 38, which comes down upon the mountains of Israel, is referred to in the prophecy of Isaiah and in Micah chapter 5 as the Assyrian. And what happened in the days of Hezekiah when the Assyrians came into the land and invaded and then were destroyed outside the walls of Jerusalem was the divine historical pattern for the future. That when God comes down upon the mountains of Israel, they too, like the Assyrians of old, will be destroyed on the mountains of Israel and 185,000 perhaps outside the walls of Jerusalem. And control from Syria to the Indus River will mean possession of the Seleucid kingdom, which in Daniel chapter 11, as we shall see in a minute, is described as the king of the north. So let's put up a couple of articles of what's happening. Tartus is to remain Russian. The heading of this article in April this year was Moscow close to finalising deal to lease Syria's Tartus port for 49 years with 25 year extensions thereafter. Now Tartus is on the coast of Syria, just a little north of the border with Lebanon. It's very, very close to Israel. 
It's just one of two ports that the Russians are using. They have Tartus and they have Latakia to the north. Now, when we were there in 2010, Tartus was actually being built. It was a port being built with entirely Russian money. There was no Syrian money going into it. And there were 50,000 Russians living in Tartus. Okay? They've just locked it in. They're keeping it. They're going nowhere. So here we're going to have the Russian power installed in two ports north of Israel. And of course Daniel 11 talks about coming down in their invasion with many ships and that's exactly what they will do. Now, I want you to look with me at Ezekiel 38 and verse 5. Now here's a list of some of the confederates that will be with Gog. The Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, names which can clearly be related to Russia. And the first of those in verse 5 is Persia. Now when you read Persia, brothers and sisters, what do you think of? Well, you could be forgiven for thinking Iran, but you would be incorrect. Yes, it does include Iran, but you see, when Ezekiel wrote this in circa 600 BC, Persia was a much bigger territory than Iran today. Now, what we have here is a map, and what we have is the Median Empire, which of course became the Medo-Persian Empire in due course between 625 and 550 BC. Now, the Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar and his successors began in 606 BC and was overtaken by the Medo-Persian in 539 BC. So when Ezekiel wrote these words that we're reading, this was his Persia. It went from the Indus River right across here into what used to be called, and we'll come to this in a minute, Armenia. All right, it's part of eastern Turkey today, but it used to be called Armenia. Now we're going to see that the three references that I referred to all say the same thing. This is the territory that has to be in the possession of Gog before Armageddon. And in fact, before Gog takes Constantinople. And it's a very important thing. So let's have a look at the next of those references. It's Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. Now we know that this verse is about the fourth empire, the Roman Empire. He says, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. So there's your Roman identifier, iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces. And then you'll notice some words in green on the screen here. And he stamped the residue with the feet of it. Now, in fact, that's never happened in the history of the Roman Empire. And, of course, it's a fascinating fact that when you go to verse 11 of Daniel 7, it tells you that this fourth empire, not to mention the other three, because also they'll be there, but this fourth empire is to be utterly destroyed by Christ. And you can't destroy something that's not there. So this empire has to be restored. And so this element that was not fulfilled in history, will yet be fulfilled in the near future. So what does it mean to stamp the residue with the feet of it? Well, I don't need to read the rest of that verse. Let's go straight to the maps. And these are the maps. Here's your Babylon Empire. The brownish area there is the, the uh, Empire of Babylon at its height. And you go to the Medo-Persian next door, it was much, much bigger. It went right over to Macedonia and over the Indus River. You come to the Grecian Empire, which was basically the same territory. And, of course, it's exactly what Daniel chapter 7 says. The successive empires consumed the one before them. They devoured much flesh in the case of the Medo-Persians. And along came Alexander. And he devoured the territory of the, of the, of the, of the Medo-Persians. But when the Romans came along you'll notice a difference. The bulk of the Roman Empire is over in Europe, over here in the Mediterranean region, not over here in the east. And you see, in 118 AD, Hadrian decided to pull back from Trajan's conquest, which went to the head of the Persian Gulf. They couldn't hold it. The Parthians were too strong. 
And so they pulled back and he, he built a line of forts uh, through what we would call modern Jordan today and that became the eastern border of the Roman Empire for the rest of its history. So you see, when you look at what the, is the residue being referred to here, it's this territory. It's Syria through to Pakistan. That's the residue which the Roman Empire never stamped with its feet. Now, when you stamp something with your feet, it's not a comfortable thing. It's talking about boots on the ground. It's talking about conquest. So here we've got, I believe, a prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled, but it's not very far away from being fulfilled, given the fact that Russia is installing itself in Syria and, of course, playing around, fiddling with the nations that are in that territory of the residue. Now, has this been understood by Christadelphians in the past? Well, yes, it has. This is Brother Murray Stewart's writings on Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, about stamping the residue. And this is what he says. Let us emphasise, here is an important statement that has not as yet been fulfilled. Rome has never trampled the residue of Persia underfoot. It has never occupied all this territory. A power must yet arise which will occupy the territories of Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome to be afterwards subjected to a higher power, namely Jesus Christ. And then he adds, Russia will do this. And of course he's quite right. Because it's Russia who will reform that fourth empire. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Thus he says, like the image of Daniel chapter 2, whose metals will have to be confederated together before they can be broken to pieces together, as is required by Daniel 2.35, so also this terrible fourth beast vision has a latter-day application. Now, we've looked then at two of those three references. Let's look at the third one. It's Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40. Daniel 11 and verse 40. Now, Daniel 11, of course, is all about two principal powers of the Grecian Empire after the death of Alexander. His empire was broken into four parts, and two of those parts became very powerful in relation to Israel in particular. And they are called, in Daniel chapter 11, the king of the north and the king of the south. To be either, you had to be what they were. They were foreign occupying powers of these territories. What you can see there is in the green, bounded by this red line, is the area of the Seleucids. One of Alexander's generals, Seleucus, formed this empire and it went on for a long time. That was called in the scripture the King of the North Territory. Over here in Egypt, we had the Ptolemaic kings and they, they were called in Daniel chapter 11 the king of the south. Now we know what happened in history. You have a look at Daniel 11 verse 40. It's fairly recent history in fact. Because it says in verse 40, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Now we need to stop for a second. Context must always be the arbiter of any biblical interpretation. So who's the him here? See what it says? The king of the south shall push at him. Well, surely it's got to be in the context the king that is mentioned in verse 36 through verse 39. The context tells you who the him is. The him happens to be the power occupying Constantinople. And Brother Thomas is very clear about this in Elpis Israel and in the exposition of Daniel. He says well, whoever is in possession of Constantinople is the little horn of the goat. And this passage here in Daniel chapter 11 verses 36 to 39 is talking about that power of chapter 8 of the prophecy, the little horn of the goat. So when you read him, read the occupant of Constantinople. So what happened in history in 1917 is pretty familiar to many of the older folk in this hall. Because you see Britain, who took control of Egypt in 1882 and did not leave it until 1954, effectively, they had quite, quite some time, they were foreign occupiers of the land of Egypt. 
And that means they could be called the king of the south, because that's what you had to be, a foreign occupier of that land, to be called the king of the south. Well, they're not there anymore, are they? So in actual fact, we don't have a king of the south anymore right at the moment. But what about this northern territory? Well, they're the subject of the second half of Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. Because it then says, And the king of the north shall come against him, the same him, the same power occupying Constantinople. So this hasn't happened yet. We have to get a king of the north first. What have we got to be to be the king of the north? A foreign occupying power of the Seleucid territory. Do we have one? No, but we're about to get one. Because you see, when Russia takes control, they've already got Syria, basically, when they take control of this region right across to the Indus River, they will become a foreign occupying power of the Seleucid territory. They will then be the king of the north. And when they become the king of the north, then they can fulfil this prophecy and take Constantinople. And when they've got Constantinople and become the eastern leg of Nebuchadnezzar's image, then they can make their invasion of Israel and down into Egypt, as is described in the rest of Daniel chapter 11, between verses 41 and 45. And there, of course, they meet their end upon the mountains of Israel at the hands of Christ and the saints. So that's a very brief summary of the content of this section of scripture. But it's very important to put together those three scriptures. Ezekiel 38 verse 5, Daniel 7 verse 7, and Daniel 11 verse 40, because they all say the same thing. And I think it's exciting that for four years we've been watching Russia in Syria. Why are they there? Well, they're there because this is the start of the process that will lead to the fulfilment of that prophecy. Now, there's something else that's happened very recently that gives me great encouragement that the day is not too far away. Have a look at this article. This is on the 4th of August this year. Russia gained stranglehold over the Persian Gulf. Really? Yes. In a potentially catastrophic escalation, says this article, of tensions in the Persian Gulf, Russia plans to use Iran's ports in Banda Bushir and Shabahar as forward military bases for warships and nuclear submarines guarded by hundreds of special forces troops, which means Russian troops, under the guise of military advisers and an air base near Banda Bushir. So it's almost exactly the same as what they've got in Syria. They have Latakia and Tartus and the airport at Latakia. Now they're going to get two ports in Iran and an airport so they can bring soldiers and equipment in and out quite easily and they're going to have a very strong presence in the Persian Gulf. That is an amazing development and of course it's fully in harmony with what we expect to happen. Well, that's all I'm going to say in relation to that particular area except now to take you to the northwestern corner of it. Because I want you to have a look with me at Ezekiel 38 and verse 6. And by the way, normally in a talk which is designed to talk about all of the things that are happening, we would normally make mention of Sudan and Libya. Now they're the subject, of course, of verse 35. After the term Persia, you'll see here you've got Ethiopia. In the Hebrew, that's Cush. And there were three Cushes in the, in the Word of God, and the third one is the one referred to here as the area of Ethiopia. The Ethiopian eunuch was from Cush, right? And the Sudan, you'll recognise, is in trouble. Uh, they, uh, they jailed their, their uh, long-standing president, uh, and now there's all sorts of turmoil going on there. And I can tell you something, uh, Russia is involved in that. There's no question about that. They're involved in what's happening uh, in Sudan, because... Before Bashir, their president, was toppled, he had agreed, he'd been to Moscow, he had agreed that the Russians could build both a military base and a naval base on the Red Sea shore of Sudan, exactly as we'd expect from Ezekiel 38 verse 5. And the second name there, of course, or the third name in that verse is Libya. And you would be aware that there's some pretty 
important things happening in Libya right now, and Russia has its finger in there. They are a supporter of the strong man in the east of Libya who probably shortly will take over that country. That's enough. We, that's all we can say about that. Come to Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 6. Now we'll come to Goma. Goma's a reference primarily to France and to Western Europe in verse 6. We'll come to that a little later on. Goma and all his bands and the house of Tagama of the north quarters and all his bands. So these are also part of the massive confederacy that Gog puts together. So what have we got here? Well, we've got an article. We've got an article which tells us that this is also well and truly underway. You see, Tagama of the North Quarters is a reference to Armenia. Not Turkey. Or yes, Turkey owns the territory of Armenia today, or 80% of it. But this reference to Tagama is actually about Armenia. So let's have a look and see. The Turkish genocide of the Armenian race from 1915 to 1922 resulted in one and a half million Armenians being put to death and shoved out into the wilderness to die of famine and seizure of 80% of their land. And the Pope went to Armenia in 2016 and said the Turks committed genocide against you Armenians and you really should get your land back. Now, if you could see there the red line, historic Armenia, this was the territory of what Armenia used to look like before the First World War. It also had what they called a little Armenia down here in Cilicia where the Apostle Paul was born. Okay, so the Turks came along between 1915 and 1922 and they took this territory. So when we, we talk about Tagama, we're actually talking about Armenia. And of course, it's a simple fact, as that previous slide suggested that the long relationship that Vladimir Putin has had with the presidents of Armenia, and they've got a new one recently, he has a long relationship with them and he's supplying weapons to Armenia, tells us something. The day will come when Armenia will get back at least portion of its territory. And that day will probably be when Russia sweeps in to take Constantinople. So we're looking at the movement, the very strong movement of events here in Ezekiel chapter 38. Tagama is the name of the Armenians, says Keel and Dalish, who are still called the House of Thorgum or the Torkomazi today. So watch that, brothers and sisters. Who's heard of Armenia? Very few. But it's very significant in relation to Bible prophecy. Well, as you can see, I want to move on to Britain and Brexit. So we ask the question, how did the Brexit vote of 23rd of June 2016 defy the polls and majority political opinion? Well, that's a good question. The answer, a storm. All right, a storm. That's how it happened, as we shall see. Why did God allow Theresa May's hubris to go to an election on the 8th of June 2017 and lose her 17-seat majority? when she could have ruled through to 2020. Why would you do that? It's ridiculous. But she did, and she lost her majority. And she's, her party is only in power because of the DUP party of Northern Ireland. Europe haters, Catholic haters. Okay, so that's a very important thing that happened. So why was Theresa May unsuccessful in achieving Britain's departure from the European Union when she tried so hard? Well, because she wanted to retain some ties with the European Union that God doesn't want them to have. Simple as that. And why does Britain now have a Prime Minister in the mould of Donald Trump? Would you have elected Donald Trump? Or even this guy? Boris Johnson? Probably not. <coughs> Okay, but God put them there because he's been using them for his purpose. Donald Trump has done more to bring about the fulfilment of Bible prophecy than the three presidents who preceded him because, you see, he's the right man for the job. Very few people thought he could make it. Very few thought it possible that a man of his character and his ilk could become the president of the United States of America, the so-called most powerful nation on earth, was about to become one of the poorest and the depression hits them, 
Well, they, very few thought that that could happen. Why did it happen? Well, because God put him there for his purpose. He uses, as our brother Jack mentioned in his prayer, the basest of men to fulfil his purpose. He puts them in power for a time that he might further his purpose in the earth, and that's what he's done. And the angels were clearly at work in the events of the 23rd of June 2016. This is a quote, we don't need even to read it out. To the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. And a storm from France, and in, in fact, it came over Brussels, the headquarters of the European Union, a storm from France on Thursday, the 23rd of June 2016, flooded parts of London, affecting the transport system and making access to polling booths difficult for, they say, about two million people. And they thought that the vote in London would carry the day for the Remain yes vote to stay in Europe. But a lot of people in that London region could not get to the polling booths on that day. And it was amazing, brothers and sisters, because what happened was this. Here's London, here's London streets, look at them, driving down through all of this mess. And they had to close polling booths. And in actual fact, there were three waves of this storm. The first one was fairly early in the morning, disrupted traffic. Then, when people in their offices said, well, that's not a problem, the polling booths are open to 10pm at night, I'll go out at lunchtime and I'll vote. Sorry, at 11am there was another downpour. So they couldn't go out. Everything had, had come to a, a, a grinding halt. Oh, that's not a problem. When I leave work at 5pm, I can catch the train home and go to the polling booth, which will be open to 10pm. Sorry, at 5pm. There's another downpour. Trains, buses, taxis, cars went nowhere. So most of them couldn't get home by 10pm to go to the polling booths. They say nearly probably 2 million people in that region could not vote on that day. And the no vote won by 1.7. There is the hand of God at work in the affairs of men. That's what happened. He rules in the kingdom of men. And why did this have to happen? Well, it had to happen because of Ezekiel 38, verse 13. And Ezekiel 38, verse 13 says this. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto Gog, Have you come to take a spoil? Now, Tarshish can be proven both from the scripture and from history to be a reference to Britain. So here is Britain that is not part of the Gogian Confederacy. In fact, the opposition to the Gogian Confederacy when they come down upon the mountains of Israel. So what has happened with Brexit, of course, is very important. The UK was scheduled to leave the European Union on the 29th of March this year, but because Theresa May couldn't get an agreement that would pass through Parliament, they extended the date to the 31st of October. In comes Boris Johnson with about two and a half, three months, to organise everything. He's now in Europe right now. He's not getting anywhere and he won't get anywhere because you see God intends that the European Union as we know it will actually disintegrate. It will not be 27 nations as it is now. It'll be 10 and they will be in a very precise area as you'll see in a moment. So we know that things are happening in many of these nations. In Italy, in the Netherlands, in Austria, in Greece and in France and even in Germany, there are strong movements now to opt out, like Britain, from the European Union. So this cartoonist has got it pretty right, hasn't he? He's got the Brits walking off and the plank's about to go down the gurgler and the European Union's about to go down the gurgler because that's what's required by Bible prophecy. So this is why Boris Johnson will have great difficulty in achieving a better deal than May did with the European Union. Because back in March, well back in the early part of this year, this was 22nd of March, the ABC reported that this European Commissioner, Jean-Claude Juncker, said the EU had done much to accommodate Britain and could go no further. And then he said this, if that doesn't happen, and if Great Britain does not leave at the end of March, then we are, I am sorry to say, in the hands of God. And they are. 
in the hands of God. Because you see, what God wants is for Britain to be fully out of Europe, to not have any ties that locks it up in any way. And God wants Britain to go back to a partnership with its former colonies, Australia, Canada, New Zealand and India. They are the young lions of Ezekiel 38 verse 13. Some of you will say, why don't you mention the US? Well, that's because Brother Thomas taught correctly that the US is not a young lion. And you'll find that in Eureka, volume 3. You'll find it in 1860 in his writings in the Herald of the Kingdom and Age to Come. He was very, very plain when he said that America has no part to play in latter-day prophecy. And he's, proved, he's going to be proven right again. So here we've got the situation. What will happen on the 31st of October 2019? Now I want to give you a biblical perspective of what I believe will happen. It's already happened. You can see that. This has basically already happened. But let's have a look at a biblical perspective. The legs and feet of the image. Well, as Brother Thomas rightly said, the feet have not yet been formed. It's a process still to be completed. But we look at what happened in the history of the Roman Empire. In 420 AD, the Roman Empire was finally resolved into two legs, with an emperor in Rome and another in Constantinople. The Roman Empire withdrew from Britain in 410 AD, ten years before the two legs were finally formed. The feet, with the ten toes, of course, is a confederation of southern European states, united for a time by Gog. It will be a brutal fusion of democracy and false religion, held together by humanism. Okay? So there is the facts of history. When the Romans left Britain in 410, the two legs of the image were not formed. So Britain can't be any part of the legs or of the feet. See, this is how Roman rule ended. Now, you may not be able to read that from the back of the hall, but these are the departure dates of the Romans from Britain. 383, the final departure from the, the west and the north. 401, final departure from Hadrian's Wall. 407, the final departure from the southeast. Well, that's where London is. 409, the expulsion of Roman magistrates from cities. And 410, the rescript of Honorius, which drew all Romans out of Britain. They were gone by the time that the two legs were formed. And you see, brothers and sisters, I think that's strongly suggestive. That if history is to be repeated, and it often is, when it comes to Bible prophecy, it will be the, it will be the Europeans that will finally say to Britain, we've had enough. We're finished with you. We're gone. And that will solve, of course, Boris Johnson's problem. It might create a few more for a while, but they will be forced into much stronger relationships with countries like Australia, who itself will be suffering from the things that are happening in the Pacific region. It's just marvellous the way the angels are at work. Brother Thomas says this in the exposition of Daniel, that Britain's no part of the image. He says... Nebuchadnezzar's image is representative of the Gogian Empire in full manifestation. It is impossible in the nature of things that Britain can be one of the ten toes. Neither can she be included among the powers prefigured by the symbols he refers to, the fourth beast and the dragon and the ten horn apocalyptic beast of Revelation chapter 17. He makes it very plain and he's going to be proven, of course, again, correct. So what does Bible prophecy require about Europe? Well, we're told. In Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 and 13, we read this. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings, one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So we are being told very plainly, there will be ten independent, notice this, they're called kings, ten independent nations with one political agenda shaped and guided by the papacy that at that time will have great power. And the European Union, or the Eurozone as we know it today, is doomed. And British withdrawal is just the beginning of the process. And the bankruptcy that's going to come from the coming depression will bring about these things. So this is the area in which those ten horns were formed because that's where they were formed in history. 
It was the barbarians who came in and broke up the Roman Empire. And there were at least 10 barbarian powers that did that. So those 10 horns will be in that region, below the Rhine and the Danube, which was the northern border of the Roman Empire for the bulk of its history. So, brothers and sisters, it's pretty clear, isn't it, that things are on the move and things are happening that we have been looking for for a long time. And as I said, that Great Depression is coming and will likely dissolve the European Union and ten nations will emerge. And we'll have the fulfilment of these prophecies. The revival of the beast of the sea, it'll come back again in, in, in a shorter form. Revelation 13, 1 to 10. The fourth beast of Daniel 7, verse 7. And Babylon the Great of Revelation chapter 17. Now I'm watching the time and it's running out on me. I want to say very f- f- quick things, few quick things about... Uh, Israel's relationship with its neighbours. Brother James will probably touch on this as well a little bit in his talk. Without reading what's on that slide, brothers and sisters, what it tells us is this, that back in 2017, a very important decision was made in Saudi Arabia. The king of Saudi Arabia appointed his son, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who was only 31 at the time, as the leader of Saudi Arabia. That has changed everything. Can you see what we're now reading are articles like this. This is November 2017. And it's about why Saudi Arabia needs Israel as an ally. And they need Israel as an ally because they've got a problem. Not only Saudi Arabia, but the Gulf states have got a problem with Iran breathing down their neck. And when bin Salman assessed his ability to defeat Iran in a land battle, which he thinks is coming... He concluded his forces do not measure up. However, with Israeli assistance, a joint force might prevail. Hence, the Crown Prince is developing joint military manoeuvres with Israel as his key ally. And that, of course, is an ongoing thing. Now, why should this be happening? Well, it's happening because of Ezekiel 38, verse 13. And if you remember nothing else, what I say about this particular matter, remember this. It's not Tarshish that's mentioned first as objecting to the Gogi invasion of the land. It's not Tarshish. Who is it? Sheba and Dedan. They are the first to object. Now, why would they object? Well, because they happen to be, at the time of Armageddon, Israel's closest allies. That's ridiculous. Seventy years they spent, these nations, trying to destroy Israel. And they're going to be Israel's closest allies at Armageddon. Did anybody expect that to happen in the world? Christadelphians did. Because the Bible says it was going to happen. So who is Yim? Who is uh, Sheba and Dedan? Well, Yemen is, is Sheba. Have a look at the ancient maps. This was where Sheba was. Okay? That's why things are happening in Yemen. That's why Saudi Arabia is in Yemen. And Yemen will finally become part of the Gulf States Confederation. All right? Go next door to Dedan. Yes, because Dedan happens to incorporate this country, Oman, as it does Saudi Arabia and the Gulf States. All right, so there, there, things are happening because Bible prophecy requires it. And we read things like this. This is last year, October. Oman publicly called on the Middle East countries to accept Israel. All sorts of things are going on there. At a recent summit in Poland, Netanyahu sat beside the foreign ministers of Yemen and Oman. He's also working very closely with, with the leaders of Qatar and Bahrain. Yeah. And we have articles like this. This is... Uh, Earlier this year, Netanyahu went to Warsaw for that particular conference. The meeting publicly showcased the remarkable fact that Israel, as Netanyahu was so keen to advertise, is winning acceptance of a sort from the wealthiest countries in the Arab world. You see, things are happening because there's this division between the Sunni Muslims, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, and the Shiite Muslims of Iran and Iraq. It's broken down, that relationship, completely. And so now the Sunni nations of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula are looking to Israel for support to be allies. Isn't that an amazing thing? Yeah. Well, I'm going to conclude on a couple of little points. I want you to turn up with me two passages. James might look at Joel 3 again tonight. Turn to Joel chapter 3, if you wouldn't mind, because this is what's happening. This is an astonishing development in the last couple of years. 
Now, you've all heard of Donald Trump's deal of the century. We don't know exactly what it is yet, but some people think they know, and Mahmoud Abbas, the leader of the Palestinians, thinks he knows what it is. And I can show you actually a, a clipping on that. But you see, the deal of the century is this. The old Saudi, Arabian, Saudi Arab League peace plan of 2003 is a dead letter. Riyadh has dropped its demand. So Riyadh's the capital of Saudi Arabia. It's dropped its demand that Israel accept a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. Since the original Saudi peace proposal, which the prince called Plan A, was dead, it is necessary to move forward to Plan B. Plan B is essentially as follows. The state of Palestine would be established in the Gaza Strip plus large tracts of territory to be annexed from northern Sinai. And Egypt has agreed to that outline, December 2017, just as prophecy requires. Because you see, when you read Joel 3 verse 4, in the context of the Gogan invasion of the land, because that's what it is, you read this. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, which is the area of the Hezbollah today, and all the coasts of Palestine? That's all I want. I ask one question. Does the West Bank, which was once slated to be a Palestinian state, have a coastline? No. Does the Gaza Strip have one? Yes. Zephaniah chapter 2. Very quickly. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 4. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive at Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe to the inhabitants of the sea coast, the nation of the Kerithites. They were Philistines. The word of Yahweh is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. See what it says about the sea coast there? In the land of the Philistines or Palestinians? Because that's where Palestinian comes from, the name Philistine. Yeah. Yeah. The Gaza Strip's got a sea coast. So the American deal of the century will get up one day and the West Bank will be annexed by Israel because it's got to be part of Israel proper. Ezekiel 38 verse 8 tells us that because go comes down upon the mountains of Israel, not the mountains of Palestine. And the Palestinians will get their stake in the Gaza Strip. One final word, Brother Jack. I'm about to finish. Okay. I want you to have... You know these verses. I don't need to even turn it up. Luke chapter 17. As it was in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. What were those days like? Well, they were filled with violence and immorality. Yes. Christ doesn't mention a word about violence and immorality. Not one word. That doesn't mean it wasn't going to happen. But he was not interested in that aspect of it. He was interested in the problem of Lot's wife. And the problem of Lot's wife was prosperity. Peace and prosperity. And the point he's making is this, brothers and sisters. When he says that as it was in the days of Noah and the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling and building and planting. And then it all came to an end. When God put Noah in the ark, and Lot and his family outside of Sodom. And that's exactly what's going to happen to you and me very shortly. We are going to be removed. On the eve of the Great Depression that's coming, that the world knows is coming. All right, how close are we to that? He comes to raise the dead. And that will be the beginning of the time of trouble such as never was of Daniel chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. And then will come Armageddon. And it will be a repetition of history. This is the timeline of depressions. 1929, stock market collapse. 1930, depression. Ten years to dig yourself out of it and then only by a war. Depression's coming. Ten years and a war. You and I will be locked away, brothers and sisters, in the quietness and the comfort, <laughs> the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ while this world goes through a time that has never, ever been seen upon earth. A time of trouble. Aren't we a blessed people? I think we are. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.